This film is a project of the Leonore Annenberg Institute for Civics of the Annenberg Public Policy Center of the University of Pennsylvania, in partnership with the Annenberg Foundation Trust at Sunnylands. Citizenship is every person's highest calling. Okay, let's do a little exercise about freedom of speech, specifically freedom of speech in school. What would happen if one of you stood on your desk and started giving an impassioned speech about, let's say, why a hot dog is a sandwich, right in the middle of this film? Or what if one of you took out your phone and posted something on social media criticizing the school, maybe even using some colorful language? Could you be punished for that? Would you be sent to the principal's office, suspended? Or is that speech protected by the First Amendment? That's a good question, and it's not as easy to answer as you might think. Freedom of speech sounds self-defining, the right to say anything anytime I want, but in fact, that's not the way it has turned out to be interpreted. We've all heard about freedom of speech, but what does it really mean? And what does it mean for students in public schools? Freedom of speech is probably our most important right as citizens. Freedom of speech means the ability to express yourself, particularly on a controversial subject, without the fear that you'll be punished for what you say. Look, it's right here in the First Amendment to the Constitution. It says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. The amendment protects your freedom of expression from government intrusion. But individuals or many other kinds of organizations remain perfectly free to punish you for what you say. So your parents telling you to zip it or even Instagram taking down one of your photos, none of that counts. No, this is about what the government can do to keep the people from expressing themselves. So, how does this apply to schools? Although you may not realize it, public schools are technically part of the government. They're funded by taxpayers and run by state and local school boards. So the First Amendment should apply, right? Well, for a long time in our history, it was assumed that public schools, that is the government, could decide what students were and were not allowed to say. And if students tried to say things the school didn't approve of, they were punished. The assumption was that the students are there to learn, um, not there to speak. That was the basic assumption. Until the Supreme Court weighed in. This is a story about students fighting for their free speech rights in public schools. What happens when First Amendment rights collide with school rules? How do you balance a school's need for order with a student's right to free expression? Okay, now before we go any further, let's go way back to understand why the framers cared so much about freedom of speech. Freedom of speech was very important to the founders because they needed freedom of speech to conduct a revolution. Speech enabled them to communicate, formulate their plans, and decide when it was time to rise up against Great Britain. They also had to convince people to join their cause. They had to get the crowd behind them. They were trying to change their government, and it was essential for that purpose that they be allowed to say what was wrong with the government they had. But the British wouldn't let them do that. Under Britain's seditious libel laws in the colonies, it was a crime for people to criticize the government. There were a lot of issues where someone criticized the king and they could be punished for it, whether what they said was true or not. So after they won the revolution and created a new form of government, the founders made freedom of speech one of the key freedoms in the Bill of Rights. Because for a democracy to work, people need to be able to speak freely. If the people are going to control the government, they have to be able to talk about it. They have to be able to say what it's doing right, what it's doing wrong, what needs to be changed. So the idea that citizens can criticize their government is really at the heart of democracy. But over the next few hundred years, the nation's courts decided there are certain types of speech in certain places where the government can place some restrictions on free speech. And one of those places is public schools. Student speech raises a whole bunch of different and pretty difficult First Amendment issues. Schools have to maintain order in order to have teaching go on. And part of that is they have to control student behavior. 
Imagine for a second what would happen if schools couldn't control any student speech. Come on, you know. You couldn't make them answer questions in class. You couldn't stop them from speaking when they weren't called on. A student in a history class cannot start giving a speech about mathematics. Okay, we got triangles and we're you cannot speak German in Spanish class. It would be chaos, right? <laughs> In order to maintain a productive learning environment, we really have to institute norms and teachers have to be allowed to enforce them. And so while students have significant free speech rights, uh, those rights are not unlimited. So what free speech protections do students have and how do we decide what speech is allowed and what is not? That story starts in 1960s Iowa with a case called Tinker v. Des Moines Independent Community School District. In 1965, Mary Beth Tinker was a 13-year-old junior high school student. I grew up in a working class community in Des Moines, Iowa. In many ways, we had a very ordinary childhood. I worried about my grades and I went roller skating on the weekends. But at the same time, there were many issues that were very controversial as far as what direction our country would go in. The 1960s were an enormous time of upheaval in American society. There were uh, civil rights protests, particularly in the South. There was enormous cultural conflict over many things, over integration, voting rights, and perhaps most importantly, over the war in Vietnam. In early 1965, the United States started sending combat troops into Vietnam. As the year went on, the violence escalated. And so by Christmas of 1965, we kids were seeing war, war, war on the news all the time. Mary Beth's father was a Methodist minister, and her mother was active in the peace movement. My parents raised us to put our values into action. And it wasn't enough to just talk about the values of love and understanding and getting along. We were supposed to actually try to make that happen. So in December of 1965, Mary Beth, her older brother John, and a group of students made a plan to wear black armbands to school to protest the Vietnam War. School authorities get wind of this plan, and they say, oh no, you are not able to wear these black armbands. This is too hot of a topic. Iowa, in particular, had the highest per capita participation in military service of any state in the Union. So the issue of the war was particularly fraught. The school district issued a rule warning that anyone who wore a black armband to school would be suspended. Many students backed out, but a few decided to wear them anyway. I was really nervous because I was very shy, and so I decided I would try to be brave. So they wear their armbands to school. The students are relatively accepting. The school administrators, however, are not. I went to my math class, Mr. Moberly's class, and I loved math. He immediately saw the black armband and gave me a pink pass to go to the office, and that's where the girl's advisor, Mrs. Tarman, gave me a suspension notice, and I went home. Several other students were also suspended, including Mary Beth's older brother, John. The school's reaction to it was quite clear. They regarded this as completely um, unpatriotic, uh, inappropriate speech. One of the students was told, you're too young to have opinions on important questions. And your job is not to have opinions, your job is to come here to learn. You've all heard that old expression, that children should be seen and not heard. That's kind of what the school was saying. Well, my family didn't believe that. They believed that you should take part in democracy and you should be active in it. To take a strong anti-war position in 1965 was an extremely courageous thing to do. America was only beginning its involvement in Vietnam and the war was supported by most Americans. Many people thought that protesting the Vietnam War was anti-American rather than anti-war. People are supposed to support the troops and support the cause. 
a lot of people got really mad at us, which was very confusing as a child because we were speaking up for peace at Christmas time. We got hate mail. We had a bomb threat to our house on Christmas Eve. But one group that didn't get mad was the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. And so they offered to help us. With the help of the ACLU, the Tinkers sued the Des Moines School District. What the school authorities were doing by telling the Tinker children that they could not wear the black armbands uh, was, in effect, silencing one side of the debate. Students who supported the war were allowed to express their views. But students like Mary Beth Tinker, who opposed the war, were not. And that's called viewpoint discrimination, something that is not allowed under the First Amendment. It means that the government can't restrict your speech simply because of your point of view. But did that apply to students? So the question of what rights do students carry into school and how should we think about those rights came squarely before the Supreme Court. In 1969, the Supreme Court ruled 7-2 to two in favor of the Tinkers, saying that First Amendment protections do, in fact, apply to students in public schools. Justice Abe Fortas wrote the majority opinion. Justice Abe Fortas writes, it can hardly be argued that students shed their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate. It means that students do have the right to speak up. And just because they go to school and are inside the school doesn't mean that they have no rights and you can just regard them as people that you can control however you wish. But while Justice Fortas says it can hardly be argued, there was in fact a major argument about whether that was the correct interpretation of the freedom of speech. Justice Hugo Black issued a scathing dissent in Tinker. And this was surprising for a number of reasons. Generally speaking, Black was a strong protector of First Amendment rights. But for him, the school situation was very different. He thought children are there to learn, not to teach. And that you need to keep order above all else. So don't let anybody do anything or say anything that seems out of the way and is not on the lesson plan for today. In other words, Justice Black didn't think students should have any First Amendment rights in schools and he felt very strongly about it. Justice Black took the unusual step of reading his dissent from the bench for many minutes. Black was very clearly influenced by what he saw going on on college campuses, which was quite different from Mary Beth Tinker's silent symbolic protest. Students were having sit-ins, students were taking over administration offices. Black thought that youth culture was getting out of control. If people could wear black armbands, next thing you know, they'd be occupying the principal's office and no learning would go on at all. And he went on about basically the inmates would be running the asylum. But Justice Fortas and the majority of the court saw it differently. He didn't think it was dangerous to let students express their views. He thought it was a key part of preparing students to become citizens. The Supreme Court ruling in Tinker versus Des Moines is one of the most beautiful rulings about what education should be in a democracy. Justice Fortas says that when students exchange ideas on the issue of the day, that is not a distraction, uh, but instead is a vital part of the educational process itself. We want people to develop into citizens, but we don't do that by trying to standardize them and tell them what to think. We do that by letting them experience the ability to dissent. It's a vision of a government that teaches by example. But the court also ruled that there should be some limits to student speech. Remember, we can't have students jumping up in history class and giving a speech about math. So the courts set a test for the kind of opinions and views that are protected in schools and the kinds that are actually not protected. So when lawyers say test, what they mean is a set of rules the court creates to give guidance to other cases that come up in the future. In this case, the test the court created became known as the Tinker Test. And what it said was, well, I'll let the person the test is named after explain it. 
The Supreme Court said that students should have free speech rights in school, except they cannot substantially disrupt school and they cannot impinge on the rights of others. Interfering with the rights of others seems pretty straightforward. But what exactly qualifies as substantial disruption? Well, that's where it gets a little tricky. We understand substantial disruption now as something that meaningfully interferes with the school's ability to teach. So discomfort, a few negative comments, harsh looks, none of that would count. If what happens disrupts the whole teaching process and makes it harder to engage in, then the courts would be likely to say, that's not something you should do. So while the ruling gives schools some leeway to decide what constitutes substantial disruption, it still gives students significant protections. Tinker is considered a landmark case because it really broadens the free speech rights of students. It's the first case in which the court looked at this context of students in school and really took seriously the idea that there is a First Amendment right there. But in the four decades after Tinker, the court heard three major student speech cases and, spoiler alert, in each case, the student lost and the school won. The first case, Bethel School District v. Frazier, arrived at the court in 1986. A high school senior named Matthew Frazier gave a speech at a school assembly nominating a friend for student government using, um, some choice language. It was a prolonged sexual innuendo and the school concluded that it was lewd and graphic. And the question was, was that speech protected? And the Supreme Court uh, said no, and uh, in effect carved out an exception to Tinker for lewd speech. Second case was in 1988, a case called Hazelwood School District versus Kuhlmeyer involving two controversial articles in a student newspaper. One was on teenage pregnancy, and the other was on parental divorce. Principal thought the articles were inappropriate, and without telling the students, he pulled them from the paper. And the students challenged it and claimed it violated their First Amendment rights. But the court sided with the school, ruling that a student newspaper is school-sponsored speech. The school newspaper even though run by students, was in some ways the voice of the school. The court really drove a truck through Tinker by creating a new category of speech called school-sponsored speech, and it gave schools enormous discretion to prevent speech and to punish speech. The third major case was in 2007 from a high school in Alaska. The formal name for the case is Morse versus Frederick, but just about everybody calls it bong hits for Jesus. Oh boy, okay. Take a minute to laugh, and yes, that really is what everybody calls it. But there's a serious issue underneath. High school senior Joseph Frederick attended an off-campus school-sponsored event with his classmates, holding a banner that read bong hits for Jesus. The school principal decided that this was a reference to drugs. She snatched it from them, and Frederick said, what about the Bill of Rights? She marched him into her office, and she suspended him. And the question was, uh, did this suspension violate the students' free speech rights? The court ruled against Frederick, saying that schools could punish student speech if it promotes illegal drug use. So with these cases, the court carved out three major categories of speech that became exceptions to Tinker lewd speech, school-sponsored speech, and pro-drug speech. And so we have decades where the court is continuously siding with the school, meaning that um, teachers and principals are allowed to restrict and punish more and more types of speech. That streak lasted until uh, Brandy Levy's case arrived at the Supreme Court. In 2017, Brandy Levy was a 14-year-old high school student in Mahanoy, Pennsylvania. She tried out for the varsity cheerleading squad, but she didn't make the cut. Coaches told her she needed to spend another year on junior varsity. She was very frustrated. She was very angry. And on a Saturday, she went with a girlfriend to a convenience store. 
and she put a snap on her Snapchat story. She took a photo of herself with her middle finger extended to the camera, and she said, uh, among other things, F cheer. So Brandy does not intend for this to spread widely. It's Snapchat, it's gonna disappear. She's got a limited circle of friends who see it. But we all know how that goes. Unfortunately, one of her classmates took a screenshot, which she showed to her mother. And even more unfortunately, her mother was a coach for this cheerleading squad. The school punished Brandy by suspending her from cheerleading altogether. They claimed that her Snapchat message was disruptive and that its vulgar language violated the team's code of conduct. And just like many other Americans who've ended up at the Supreme Court, Brandy Levy thinks this is wrong, and she thinks she's going to stand up for her rights. With the help of the ACLU, Brandy and her parents sued the Mahanoy Area School District. She believed the school didn't have the right to punish her for something she said off campus on the weekend. It was an important question because the Supreme Court had never weighed in on students' speech rights when they are off campus rather than on campus. Could she be punished for expressing her feelings on Snapchat? Especially could she be punished when she didn't do it at school? In the 50 years after Tinker, social media had drastically changed the way students communicate. Justice Fortas and Tinker says it can hardly be argued that students shed their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate. Well, in the age of social media, where does the schoolhouse gate begin and end? Social media really blurs the line between on-campus and off-campus speech because students may create the social media off campus, as Brandy Levy did here, but it can be accessed on campus. And so something that's created outside of school can be seen, heard, read, spread around inside school. And it can be having direct effects on students during the school day. Remember the Tinker Test? It said students have a right to free speech in school, but not if it creates substantial disruption. So the school argued that if a social media post substantially disrupts what's going on at school, they should have the right to punish that speech, even if it was written off campus. And the uh, lawyer for the ACLU, which was representing Brandy Levy, she said if schools are allowed to do this, the students would be carrying the schoolhouse on their back all the time. And it's a great image that you can't shake free of the authority of the school. In other words, anytime a student posts something online, they would have to think about whether or not the school could punish them for it. So you might be thinking, wait a minute, Brandy wasn't talking about war politics. She was just venting about cheerleading in a way that some people found offensive. Why should we care about protecting this kind of speech? No, Brandy Levy wasn't talking about the Vietnam War, but she was talking about the operations of the government entity that was exerting control over her life. And she was saying, I've been treated unfairly. Even though this is not political speech, it is important for individuals to be able to convey their feelings in a powerful, emotional way. Um, and that that's a, a part of what the First Amendment uh, is designed to protect. In 2021, after hearing oral arguments remotely, the Supreme Court ruled eight to one in favor of Brandy Levy. The court said that Brandy's post did not cause substantial disruption at school, and because of that, her off-campus speech was protected by the First Amendment. The court ruled for Brandy, but it didn't rule for Brandy in a way that creates clear guidance. The court said that the First Amendment limits the school's ability to punish off-campus speech, but doesn't completely prohibit it. In certain situations, like cases of online bullying or harassment, the school might be able to punish off-campus speech, but the court didn't provide clear rules. The court seemed very aware of the difficulties that different kinds of situations might present, and they didn't want to write a broad rule that would tie their hands for those future cases. Schools are in a very difficult position uh, these days with respect to social media. For example, if a student posts something online targeting other students that is racist or vulgar or sexually harassing, what happens if the school can't punish them? How can they provide a safe learning environment for all students? 
Schools, you know, coaches, teachers, principals need to have some tools to address proper norms of behavior. These are all issues that schools have to grapple with, and it's not easy. The ruling didn't make a bold statement for future cases, but it was still a very important one. It was the first time in 50 years that a student won a free speech case at the Supreme Court. Justice Breyer, who wrote the majority opinion, echoed ideals from the Tinker decision, saying America's public schools are the nurseries of democracy. What Justice Breyer is expressing, really, is that schools broadly, as institutions, are meant to train citizens. And the way to do it is to allow young people to exchange their views, even when they are inappropriate sometimes, even when they are mistaken. And whether students are talking about war or cheerleading or some other topic, the First Amendment protects them. And I think we shouldn't forget the courage that it takes to offer this sort of dissenting voice, to be the lone critic, to be swimming against the tide of majority opinion. We would not have the Constitution that we have today if it weren't for Mary Beth and John Tinker standing up against the Des Moines School District or for Brandy Levy standing up against the school districts in Pennsylvania. Ordinary Americans can shape our constitutional rights in really profound ways. When you look around the country today, you can see the legacy of the Tinker case. Students today are able to make arguments on both sides of issues. And schools can no longer say to them, you can't argue that. You can't say that. And that's important. It prepares them to be engaged citizens. But it's not always so easy. Students are still having to really struggle to speak up and express their views and to stand up for their rights. Really, your voice is your power. And so the way that you use it, the way that you wield it, is the way that you act as a citizen. And this is really the core part of your civic power that you can start practicing now and continue using for the rest of your life. <laughs>